looking at is a second um, aqueduct from west of the Hudson, under the Hudson, into the terminal reservoir so that we again have a parallel system so that we need to get into one of the aqueducts, say the Delaware aqueduct, to make repairs. We can shut it down for a year if we have to and use the second aqueduct. So we are looking at that. We're looking at, again, a well system running from the old city of Brooklyn forest supply. Um, that's just about perfect. Thank you. He just <laughs> told me he's throwing me out of here, but that's all right. Uh, one of the things that you may not be aware of if you don't live in South Queens or South Brooklyn is that we used to have a systemic drought in this area going back to the 60s and 70s. That systemic drought is well over. Those of us who have gone through the last two years know full well that it's over. And what's happening is the groundwater elevations in South Queens and South Brooklyn have rebounded over 30 feet in elevation in the last 10 to 15 years. Buildings that were designed 20 years ago that had cellars now have swimming pools in the cellar. <laughs> so we, the, the city of New York and the MTA, pump water out of the ground, pump it into the city's sewers and spill it and waste it because they need to do that in order to keep their facilities dry. So one of the things that the agency is looking at is developing a system of wells that would run east and west through Brooklyn and Queens that we could then take water out of, adding it to the supply system for the city of New York and making the city that much safer. Um, last one I'll talk about is, uh, and it has nothing to do with the potable water supply system per se, it's much bigger in the wastewater, but it's, it's important to remember. Here we are on 34th Street and 5th Avenue. And about nine, the year 2000, I was sitting in 5th Avenue and 20th Street in water up to my knees. The entire street was full of water because a 36-inch main had gone bad. And I said to the agency, well, what we need to do is to put a new main in. And they said, who's going to tell the merchants on 5th Avenue that we're digging up 5th Avenue, blocking it off, and we'll probably not be able to reopen it for 18 months? Okay? And the answer is nobody wants to be that. So what the agency is looking at now is ways to do trenchless uh, technology so that they can horizontally put these in by either sleeving the existing pipes that are there or by pushing a pipe in front of it by hydraulic pressure so that they can avoid having the open streets in the heavily urban areas of, of like Lower Manhattan. And I guess that's pretty much what I've got to say to you tonight. Hi. I could have told him that was going to happen. I, uh, am, I have this magnetic aura about me, an electronic dysfunction of some sort. Hello, hello. I am so pleased to be here. Um, it's uh, a pleasure for me to be here uh, and uh, a privilege to be the West of Hudson voice on this distinguished panel tonight. Um, usually when I give presentations about the development of the city water system, I spend a fair amount of time talking about the people who actually built this amazing system. Um, theirs is a, a really compelling story over a couple of centuries um, 
but um, I'm not going to do that tonight, and um, uh, I uh, will leave the um, the labor point of view to uh, Dale, who uh, I'm sure will be an eloquent spokesperson um, for that um, topic. Um, I've been asked actually to explain the 1997 watershed agreement and the partnership that was established to protect the environment and support upstate communities. Um, but in order to appreciate the groundbreaking agreement, you uh, must first recognize how many hearts were broken in the Catskills in the first half of the 20th century as the city laid claim to vast stretches of valley lands in the building of its six reservoirs. Um, the uh, lingering pain and anger harbored by upstate residents toward the city was a significant force to be reckoned with during negotiations for the agreement. So I'd like to look backwards for just a few minutes and see how history influenced the pact that was forged to take the city and the watershed into the future. The city's first foray west of the Hudson was to dam the Esopus Creek to build the Ashokan Reservoir. More than 2,000 people in 12 communities along a 12-mile stretch of the Esopus were forced to move. Some of the hamlets were relocated outside the taking line. Others were simply leveled. Using the power of eminent domain, the city condemned homes, farms, stores, schools, and mills, and at least 10 churches and 30 cemeteries whose 2,637 graves were reinterred elsewhere. 13 miles of the Ulster and Delaware Railroad were also moved out of the water's way. Between 1907 and 1913, people who had spent their whole lives in the valley on homesteads that had been in their families for generations were displaced. They had raised children, cared for aging parents, worked in the fields and orchards, served summer guests at boarding houses, danced at local entertainment halls, prayed at country churches their grandparents had built, told they must leave their homes, uproot their dead, and see the lands they had lovingly cultivated be inundated, they were deeply wounded and resentful. Community fears stemming from hundreds of dam laborers in their midst, speaking in foreign languages, and not always Irish. Uh, we won't pick on the Irish. Um, there were lots of Italians and Russians and Hungarians uh, and many, many others um, who built the systems, the earlier systems. Um, the, uh, the, the local um, community leaders uh, prompted the, board of water, the then Board of Water Supply to form a police force to keep order in construction zones. Nearly 100 years later, this police force, greatly expanded now, has become a bone of contention whose jurisdiction and powers are currently being challenged in court. The upheaval experienced at Ashokan was repeated in Gilboa as the Schoharie Reservoir was built. About 350 people had to move and 2,300 acres were cleared. During the 1920s, a long and bitter legal battle took place over assessment of city property. The city, which had long paid taxes on unimproved land only, was hit with a big tax bill for the Gilboa Dam. Claiming it was being overassessed, the city refused to pay. The county responded by advertising the dam for sale for back taxes. <laughs> Eventually, a state Supreme Court ruling um, um, affirmed that the dam and other improvements on city lands were indeed taxable. The financial and legal repercussions of that decision have been felt ever since by both the city and the communities where it is a property owner. In fact, the 1997 MOA created a special fund using New York City money to help municipalities, upstate municipalities, meet city assessment challenges. A decade after the Schoharie was finished, nearly 10,000 acres of land were condemned for the Neversink and Rondout reservoirs, and 1,500 people were displaced. Some buildings were moved, including a few to new Neversink that sprang up on Route 20 55 between the Neversink Reservoir and Grahamsville. 
The community hall there was built from trees cut from the reservoir basin. Other structures, including churches, post offices, and other community buildings were bulldozed and burned, and every trace of vegetation and humanity was removed. One's age, income, or pedigree did not matter. A house and a fish hatchery owned by Edward Ringwood Hewitt was taken, were taken. He was an industrialist, an inventor, an agricultural innovator, and an avid fly fisherman. He was also the son of former New York City Mayor Abram Hewitt, but that did not prevent condemnation of most of his holdings in the Never Sink Basin. Of course, the city paid for the properties that it took. Some people accepted the initial buyout offers, but most rejected them as too low and countered with higher damage claims. These were argued before three-person commissions of appraisal, which tried to balance conflicting claims to come up with awards. In many cases, it took years for property owners to receive payment. And no amount of pleading could change the harsh reality of eviction. Said one Neversink resident, if you don't like the settlement that's made on your property, the city will reach right down through the chimney and take it anyway. When the city moved on to build the Papacton Reservoir in the late 1940s, another 974 people were forced to move from four condemned communities and surrounding farmland. Between 1955 and 1965, the Cannonsville Reservoir was constructed. Nearly 20,000 more acres were taken, 31 square miles. Five communities were eliminated, 941 people were dislocated. The Delaware Commission of Appraisal began meeting in 1935 as construction on the Rondout Reservoir began. It was not until 1993, almost 20 years after the Cannonsville Reservoir was finished, that the last of the 6,700 claims were settled, but the $26.8 million distributed by the city to pay those claims was only partial ointment for long festering wounds. And so in 1990, when New York City announced plans to strengthen its hold on the watershed, those painful memories resurfaced and the battle was joined, as I'm sure Joel can attest. Under pressure from the US EPA to prove it could protect its water at the source of, uh, in lieu of filtering it, the city proposed new sweeping regulations many in the watershed felt would put farms out of, businesses, out of business cripple commerce, and drive residents to move away. The city's plans to acquire more land also raised a red flag in communities where the memory of condemned homes and barns being bulldozed and burned was still fresh. Um, you might notice uh, that the, the inscription on this t-shirt, down to earth Delaware County, carrying a load for New York City water. <laughs> there are some bumper stickers currently circulating up in the watershed on, with a sort of a similar theme these days. Um, on the theory that there is strength in numbers, the West of Hudson municipalities in five counties formed the coalition of watershed towns to represent their interests. Perry Shelton became its first president. Perry had for 30 years been supervisor of the town of Tompkins, which lost a quarter of its land and half of its population to the Cannonsville Reservoir. After years of sometimes acrimonious debate and the intervention of the governor, who basically locked everybody in a room and said, uh, don't come out till you can play nice, the New York City Watershed Memorandum of Agreement was drafted. It was signed with great fanfare in January of 1997. Given the sad history I've just recounted, it's amazing that it happened at all. Even more remarkable is that it appears to be working. The MOA hammered out between New York City, the Coalition of Watershed Towns, representatives of environmental interests, and state and federal governments has a little something for everyone. The city got a five-year waiver from the EPA to avoid building an expensive filtration plant for its Catskill, Delaware supply. It also got a state permit to purchase vacant land on a willing seller basis in order to prohibit development on those lands. The coalition held out for a requirement that condemnation never be used for this land acquisition. 
It bargained for lump sum good neighbor payments to 35 towns and four counties in the west of Hudson Watershed, as well as a $60 million economic development fund capitalized by the city as a means of mitigating the anticipated business and tax impacts of land acquisition and new regulations. The environmental community was largely satisfied with those new rules adopted in May of 1997. The regulations deal with septic systems, road salt storage, stormwater runoff, and other potential water contaminants. It should be noted here that farms are not regulated under the MOA. Farmers and agricultural interests reached a separate agreement with the city in 1994 to encourage voluntary installation of best management practices on farms. This program and an ancillary forest program is managed by the Watershed Agricultural Council. It's been very successful and now extends to small farms east of the, of the uh, Hudson and the Croton watershed. Central to the MOA and to the subsequent FAD, uh, the Filtration Avoidance Determination signed in 2002, are several partnership programs, most of them city funded, designed to protect water quality, preserve and support communities, and educate upstate stewards and downstate consumers about this critical water resource. The Catskill Watershed Corporation, headed today by former coalition president Perry Shelton, is among a whole host of agencies from all levels of government that are working to make this happen. Sewage treatment plants and community wastewater systems are being planned or built in 12 communities. Stormwater controls have been installed throughout the watershed, and 39 storage salt, uh, salt, uh, road salt and sand storage facilities have been built. 1,925 failed residential septic systems have been replaced. More than 100 low interest loans valued at over $20 million have been awarded to watershed businesses. <clears throat> Economic development grants have fostered health care improvements, job creation, cultural enhancements, and cooperative business activity in the west of Hudson watershed. Education grants have gone to schools and organizations in the watershed and in New York City to increase knowledge of water quality issues and to improve upstate downstate communications. Planning grants have been awarded to dozens of municipalities to encourage ba a balance between environmental protection and development. These partnership programs in which former adversaries are obliged to cooperate and collaborate are where the rubber meets the road and the road is not without its bumps and potholes. Several conflicts have emerged over the past couple of years, but I liken it to the seven-year itch and trust that with the goodwill of all the parties and judicious facilitation by the Umbrella Watershed Protection and Partnership Council, the marriage, though born of a shotgun wedding, will survive. As CWC's President Shelton said in our annual report this year, our lives changed forever 100 years ago. We can never go back. We can only deal honestly and in good faith with one another into the future. Thank you. And I probably set the pace by going too long, and we're now going to go to uh, Bob, and hopefully he can keep it short and uh, Michael and Dale as well, and we'll have a little time for questioning. Okay, at this point, we're um, focusing on uh, the high bridge, kind of going from the macro scale to the, to the micro scale to this one very significant feature of the old Croton Aqueduct that is uh, in New York City. Major uh, David Bates Douglas was really the, the original visionary of the, of the old Croton Aqueduct in, uh, in engineering terms. Um, Gerard mentioned uh, Mindred Van Shake, who was the father of the, of the system in, in, the, uh, in, in, a, in a different, maybe a spiritual sense and a political sense. But uh, Douglas was, was the visionary more than, more than Jervis. Jervis uh, replaced Douglas, but Jervis did so at a time when the system had largely been laid out. Uh, Douglas 
uh, was hired by the city as an engineer to do an 1833 and 1835 report. The 1835 report ultimately was voted on by the city as a, as a referendum because uh, it involved uh, such an enormous expenditure and, and borrowing of money. Um, uh, he was uh, then selected as the first chief engineer of the system, and he largely uh, uh, determined the route, the major structures of the system, the hydraulic engineering of the system. Um, the, the biggest challenge was really to get the water from the mainland to Manhattan Island across the Harlem River. Um, uh, he selected the basic site. Um, he established a 126-foot height. Uh, there are no drawings, so it's hard to really pin down exactly what, uh, what he was thinking. But it, was, it would have had a, a range of large semicircular arches. Um, he had conceived it as having carriage lanes. And of course, the high bridge that was built uh, never had vehicles crossing it. It was always um, a pedestrian bridge. He cited uh, precedents of uh, aqueducts, aqueduct bridges that had been built because people were nervous that a structure like that, which had no precedent in this country, could successfully be built. And he pointed out that these large masonry structures had been, had been built like the, uh, the one in Lisbon, which was an 18th century aqueduct, uh, Spoleto, 14th century, and of course the famous uh, ancient models from uh, uh, Roman engineering. The, uh, there was another engineer uh, named John Martineau who uh, contributed to the 1835 uh, report and he recommended a siphon which is where the water kind of goes down in a pipe and then back up to the grade level of the aqueduct uh, for crossing the Harlem River because it would cost so much less uh, than a bridge. Um, it, it would have had a 60-foot arch really, which really would not let river traffic pass. Uh, there were some other proposals, like a, a suspension bridge or a wooden arch bridge. Um, those, those were not by the, the, the major engineers uh, who contributed to the report. Um, in October uh, 1836, uh, Douglas was fired by the, uh, the water commissioners, and Jervis was, was hired uh, due to various reasons. This obviously is not the time and place to discuss that. But, um, uh, but Douglas really was a competent engineer and could have completed the system. Jervis had more of that sort of, you know, get it done, value engineering kind of personality. And he did do a, a, a really brilliant uh, a job of completing the system. Uh, Jervis was faced with this choice, basically, of how to cross the Harlem, uh, which he had to get down into real specifics. He prepared cost estimates for a high bridge, which was almost a million dollars, and the, uh, the low bridge scheme, which he developed from Martineau's uh, siphon concept, uh, and found that the low bridge was a much less uh, expensive alternative. And um, he and the water commission strongly uh, uh, recommended that to the city. Now again, this was a situation where you have an agency that's building a large project, and you have surrounding landowners who feel differently about it. That's a theme that runs through the history of the system. And the landowners uh, successfully uh, lobbied uh, for, for a high bridge rather than uh, the, the low bridge. Um, well, the, the, uh, Jervis developed both schemes. This is the, the original uh, high bridge scheme. You can see it looks somewhat different than what was built. It had 16 arches, uh, which went down to a smaller size, to 30 feet. This version, you can see, has uh, the original masonry aqueduct going across, and it was 112 feet tall at the highest point. Uh, this was the low bridge scheme. Uh, it was really quite a, a quirky looking uh, structure. Um, the, the lower drawing shows, uh, this is the Bronx side. It would go down in a, in a siphon across much of the river, and then up in a sort of diagonal masonry arch. And this one arch here would be large enough for the river to pass through, and that would serve as the shipping channel also. I, I have no experience as a skipper of tall ships, but I can say that I would hate to try to navigate a, a, a tall sailing ship th uh, through that 80-foot uh, arch. Now, the final selection uh, came down to an, an act of the legislature, which um, had been lobbied by those uh, uh, residents surrounding the bridge. Uh, which said that it had to go through a high bridge or a tunnel under the river. The low bridge was not an acceptable scheme. 
So Jervis modified uh, the hybrid scheme um, to reduce the amount of masonry that was used and uh, brought it down by about 100,000 and designed a, a, a tunnel scheme. And you can see here, this is the cost difference, that the tunnel actually would have been less. But Jervis wisely uh, recommended against the tunnel because he felt that there were uncertainties as to the ability to, to build a tunnel and to maintain it properly in the long term. Uh, this is the, uh, the tunnel scheme. Basically, it was not a tunnel like the ones that we think of today, where you're really kind of, you know, tunneling through solid uh, uh, rock and so forth uh, beneath the channel of the river. This would have dredged the river, and they would have had to build a 400-foot-long uh, coffer dam um, and then actually excavate out in the channel and build it like that. Um, and there were a number of problems. He was nervous about the, uh, the stability of the coffer dam uh, during construction with the pressure of the river water. Um, and also uh, the protection of the pipes from uh, salt water in the long term. And it's good they didn't build it. I think it wouldn't, it wouldn't have served the shipping in the, in the river for long because it really just had an 18-foot draft at high water. And um, just to, to explore uh, the technology of tunnel construction at that time, the first real subaqueous tunnel um, was still under construction at that time, the uh, Thames Tunnel, uh, in England by uh, Brunel, uh, which was built with this tunneling shield where you could actually sort of excavate at the, you know, at the, at the heading and then build the, the, the tunnel as you go along. It was new technology. They had been struggling to complete this. They had had a lot of uh, delays, uh, lethal accidents. Um, it was completed in 1842, but when they were making these decisions here in 1838 and 39, that did not look like uh, something you wanted to get into. Um, but the, uh, the lower illustration here um, shows the, uh, uh, the New Croton Aqueduct that was constructed in the 1880s. And just for a sense of, of how, how, you know, the foresight of Jervis not to get into this kind of tunneling in the uh, uh, 1830s and 40s, they had a, a very difficult time when they, they did an experimental drift um, across the river. And, and at this point, they started getting an incredible amount of, of leaking through the roof of the tunnel, and the, the, uh, it wasn't stable. And uh, the, these are these uh, 19th century uh, sand hogs. And I have to say, I don't understand how anyone could, could convince them to stay in there and try to stabilize this tunnel. You know, I think I would just run out screaming. Um, but at any rate, they, they built the tunnel down, down lower, and it was just a very difficult project, uh, even in the 1880s. The shafts were difficult, the tunnel was difficult, and uh, would not have been a good 1830s and 40s project. Okay, this, um, this is the modified high bridge that Jervis uh, developed, and this is what was actually built. Uh, you can see it was lowered. The aqueduct comes in at this point. It actually goes into a siphon that was sort of borrowed from a Martineau scheme. It drops 12 feet in iron pipes and goes, slopes back up and, and, uh, to the aqueduct gradient on the other side. Um, here you see, instead of that masonry tunnel, you have pipes with really uh, earth fill over them. And it was designed to have uh, drainage channels that went down through the, uh, through the piers of the bridge and out at the bottom. And if you go by the bottom of the bridge today along Sedgwick Avenue, you can see these big weep holes where those channels come out. And they're not 3 8 inch plastic weeps. They're serious weep holes. Um, so the, uh, when they built it, they put in two 36 inch uh, iron pipes rather than uh, two 48 inch, uh, which would have taken the full uh, supply of the system. It was a temporary situation, and it's hard to understand why they did it. But if you think of how expensive it was to get these large uh, pipes fabricated in those days, and just the, the logistics of, uh, of handling them and installing them, it was actually large savings to do the two 36-inch pipes, with the idea that they would um, uh, add to it later. The construction of the high bridge began in uh, 1839. And um, while the, the high bridge opened um, uh, just a few years later, I mean, the, the, uh, the Old Croton Aqueduct opened a few uh, years later. Uh, the, the high bridge was not completed until uh, 1848. Um, 
what they did was they put a temporary siphon across the, the Harlem River. It went uh, over there, and you can see that jet was something that they, they did for some um, uh, functional purpose, but also they used it for display because it made these dramatic jets of water that people loved watching. You can see here the bridge is under construction. Uh, I believe those are the, the, the coffer dams that they, were, they, they used to, to get down um, uh, <clears throat> to, the, to the surface of, of under the water. And uh, Jervis stayed on after the completion of the aqueduct uh, at half salary just to complete this, this project. Uh, these are some basic uh, vital statistics of the bridge. Uh, 1,450 feet from gatehouse to gatehouse. It was really very long for this type of structure. Um, the height here, 100 uh, uh, feet. That was a, a quirk that uh, uh, the Jervis used to, to push through uh, making the bridge lower to save money on masonry, where the, the legislation really said it couldn't be less than 100 feet. And he sort of turned that to, to saying that it couldn't be more than 100 feet. So he had to drop it 12 feet. Uh, that's not how I read the legislation. But, uh, it was a good plan. So the original had uh, uh, 30 MGD of capacity, a million gallons per day, which was sufficient for the city at that time, although well below the, the, uh, the ultimate capacity of that aqueduct. From the start, the hybrid was used for uh, public access and, and, uh, and recreation. Um, and uh, the, the aqueduct, and particularly the, uh, the hybrid. This is an illustration of Edgar Allan Poe, who lived in the village of Fordham in the uh, 1840s. And this is a, a, a later illustration of, um, of people on probably a Sunday afternoon uh, promenading on, on the high bridge. The major uh, improvement in the aqueduct was done under uh, Chief Engineer Alfred uh, W. Craven. Was the, it was the installation of this large pipe. And you can see in, in this drawing, this was the original height of the parapet. And they, they, uh, they, they built this over the uh, two 36-inch mains and then did a brick, uh, a brick arch over it and raised the height of the parapet. It actually made it more architecturally attractive. Uh, and that was pointed out at the time. Um, it had more of the proportions of a, a typical Roman aqueduct. The uh, high service works was the tower and reservoir um, that are on the uh, Manhattan side of the high bridge today. And uh, this was, they foresaw that this would be needed when they uh, designed the aqueduct. In a gravity fed system like the old Croton aqueduct, you can't supply water to people who are higher than the aqueduct and the neighborhoods of northern Manhattan are, are higher than the head of the aqueduct. Uh, almost no one lived there at the time that the aqueduct was built, and so there was no thought of supplying it. But within a few decades, uh, the, those, those uh, communities were larger and starting to fit in with the, uh, with the city. And uh, one comment is that, that really this, these, uh, that this is the tower and reservoir uh, in this view. They were really built, in a sense, the, the same way that you build a, a water tank on the roof of, uh, of a building, um, you know, to, to store water and it gets fed by gravity uh, to, to those higher areas. Um, and I've heard some exotic explanations of why that, those things were built that are not really accurate, <laughs> or there may be, you know, hindsight how it was used later. Um, the High Bridge as, as a landmark this bridge was, was a major tourist destination throughout the uh, 19th century and well into the 20th century. Um, it, it, uh, it connected with many transportation means. It uh, had access to the waterfront, um, to ferry landings. There was a, a rail stop. Uh, Metro North um, goes right past, and it, it had a link to the, uh, to the park paths and, uh, and roads on both sides. Um, this is the final slide. The major uh, change following that was uh, the demolition of the five uh, arches over the Harlem River and the construction of the steel arch. Um, after the First World War, the Navy insisted on improving uh, navigation in the Harlem River and insisted on, uh, on demolishing uh, the aqueduct. And the city finally uh, planned uh, to go along with that. And there was really an outcry. It was probably one of the early preservation campaigns to save a civil engineering work. Um, 
And a, a famous uh, editorial was Scientific American in um, 1923. This is the, the lead uh, paragraph, referring to it as municipal vandalism. Um, however, they did support some, some changes. And I think that, that much as you know, I would protest against demolishing those uh, masonry arches if it were to happen today, they, they're looking at it from a 1927 point of view that that was preservation in their sense uh, and it added improvements to, to the bridge in, the, in their view. And a precedent was the uh, Washington Bridge which had masonry arches and a steel arch uh, just north of the high bridge. And also if you look at the, uh, the New Croton Dam which is really the, the crowning achievement of the Croton Aqueduct system in general, there was a masonry dam and then the steel arch. And I think that that combination of masonry and steel looked beautiful to the, uh, to the, to the eye of that time. And uh, this is the bridge as we see it today. So much as uh, it's upsetting to, uh, to have that change, I think we need to see it from that, its beauty from that point of view. Yeah. Okay, thank you. First, I'd like to say that this is a, a unique opportunity for me. Usually when I show up to a community group or a public presentation and I want to talk about a bridge, the first reaction I get is, go away, we don't want you in our neighborhood, you're going to disrupt traffic, <laughs> we don't need you to work on our bridge. Uh, so this is uh, a pleasure. Uh, um, we were looking at what we were tasked to do as part of New York City DOT, um, since the bridge is owned by the Parks Department, was to perform an in-depth inspection of the bridge. We started the inspection in August of 2002, and by the time we complete the inspection, hopefully this year, um, and deliver our final report to, to the Parks Department, we will have spent almost $2 million um, on the inspection alone, which kind of doubles the cost of the, the original construction of the bridge. <laughs> uh, our mandate uh, was to provide a detailed report that will work as a as a road map for the Parks Department in bringing back this structure to, um, to use by the public and for, for, the, for the pedestrians who can finally enjoy the view. Just a little uh, view of the existing steel arch um, that was replaced in 1927. And a closer view of the, the promenade. Um, you can't tell from here but that promenade has a, is a crown to it. And uh, the one day I went out there five years ago to, to meet with the Parks Department, um, what you notice is that that railing is pretty low. <laughs> and with a strong sense of self-preservation, I stayed in the middle <laughs> of the walkway because <laughs> there's not much between you and that river. Um, so just a little bit about the inspection that we've accomplished. The first thing we had to do was because really what you're walking on is the roof of, of the structure. You're actually, you can almost envision this as a, as a covered bridge where the, actual walkway, where the actual walkway is the roof and the main part is, is underneath. So for us to do some in-depth inspection, we actually had to, to cut in and create some access ports and manholes. So that had to be done as part of our uh, inspection process. This is a view inside of the existing 90-inch cast iron main. It's, it's not in service anymore. <laughs> um, one of the things that we did find was there was a significant activity, a bad activity in the area. <laughs> the, the inspectors kept dodging them, from what I hear. Um, so what you're, sta you're standing inside that, that, that space. And you, when you look up, that's the ceiling you're looking at, which everybody's walking on, or, or we plan for people to walk on. And one of our concerns is those tie rods. Those tie rods, when we looked at the original drawings, appear to be holding the roof together. But we're not sure, because in some locations, they've rusted away completely. <laughs> so either it's structurally unsound, or they weren't really there for for construction purposes, they were there for construction purposes and not, weren't meant for uh, long-term use. What our final operation for the inspection is to remove five of these tie rods, 
test them, and also when we remove them to uh, evaluate the, uh, the, the impact on the adjacent tie rods um, and see if there really are any strain, any load on, on those tie rods that, that, that they're seeing from, from the walkway. The first thing we, we did was we actually went in and what you're looking at, that, that piece right there, that's the, the nut end of the, of the tie rod that's coming through the wall. So we had to make sure that they were actually there and actually they turned out to be different than what was shown on the drawings. So we had to remove those stones to get to access to those, those rods. We also, um, you'll notice that you noticed on some of the drawings um, that the, those, shaft, those piers are hollow. So since we couldn't get a person down there, we dropped a remote camera down the shaft as far as we could to, eval to inspect the inside. Um, the photo on the left shows one of the four chambers that are in each span, that are in each pier. And the photo on the right is one of the hollow, is one of the hollow piers. Um, we, we did find some uh, work debris, uh, including a bucket that we, we can't date and maybe eventually we'll try to get it out or we'll leave that to the parks folks to, to get it out for us. Um, we, we checked the, the masonry piers. They appear to be level and plumb, which is a good sign. Um, there is some, uh, some loss of mortar between the stones, um, but it doesn't have seemed to have affected the, the structure uh, considerably. We did go in and take um, three and a half foot long cores uh, to determine whether there's any river water coming up into the pier and affecting the concrete. Um, we didn't find any water in the piers. So another good sign. We also took some steel samples to, make, to test them for property and materials. And one of the most uh, intrepid exercises, uh, we had a floating barge uh, with a 100-foot man lift. And if you've ever been on a boat and it bobs up and down, <laughs> Magnify that by 100 feet. I hear, uh, the inspection crew spent a lot of time going up and down in the bucket because every time a vessel wanted to pass by, they got, they got out of the bucket and brought it down. <laughs> and that was the only way we could access some of the lower members of the steel uh, arch. And where we couldn't do that, uh, the poor soul over here uh, got out there on a, on a work platform that's suspended on cables uh, and did some hands-on inspection. This is the, uh, the gatehouses. Uh, these are massive structures um, at the ends of the, on, at the Manhattan and Bronx side. Um, they were also inspected. And also, since they hadn't been accessed for a very long time, the first activity was to actually uh, install new steel doors so that we could gain access and also prevent people from accessing it behind us when we weren't around. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, we found that the kids were, were use, still used, even though we had, even though the place is fenced off, the kids were still managing to get across the fences and uh, get across the river to the other side to the swimming pool. Um, the last thing we looked at, one of the last things we looked at was the steel pins, that, and they are functioning as designed, and hopefully they'll continue to function. And one last slide. And of course, you know, the, the, the structure is a landmark structure, and hopefully we can restore it as part of the Greenway connecting Manhattan and the Bronx. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Uh, this is definitely a unique experience for me. Uh, what I've titled my, uh, my presentation tonight is, is the work of a Santa, what we do, and the significant changes in the last uh, 30 years that I've been doing it. Uh, the work is still the same. Uh, it's wet, it's dirty, it can be cold, but uh, the way we do things, the equipment we use uh, is a lot different. Uh, <clears throat> Just to expand on my biography just a little bit, uh, if, if you look up there in Papacton Reservoir, uh, I was actually born on the east end of it in Margaretville, New York. 
I was raised on the west end of it at the Downsville Dam. And for the last 19 years, roughly out of my career, I've worked on the water tunnel, the third water tunnel system here in New York. Uh, as I uh, said in the program, I'm a second generation Sanog, and this picture was actually taken in uh, 1951. If I can get this thing to work, that's my father right there. This was on the East Delaware Aqueduct. Like a, a lot of upstaters of his generation, he just got out of the service and was looking for a job, and, and this is how he got into tunnels. And actually, I think I was about a year old when that picture was taken. Uh, types of work that we do is kind of easy. We either sink a shaft or we drive a tunnel. <laughs> right there, you're looking down a 586-foot shaft. That's a 26B where we're actually working now. That was... Uh, finished around 1995 and, and covered, and then we opened it back up in uh, 2002, I think it was, and actually the water was right in there someplace. About a million 600,000 gallons of water we pumped to get, to get it dry again. This is uh, looking at a 24-foot finished tunnel. Uh, they're a sight to see. Uh, different tunnel uses that, that we build tunnels for is first is, is the water tunnel has been our main employer for years. Uh, we do sewer, subway, uh, Con Edison just had a steam tunnel we did, and road tunnels such as the Battery Tunnel or Lincoln Tunnel. Just uh, a lot of you have seen this illustration before. It just shows the different infrastructure in New York City, and you can see where we are right there. <laughs> We're kind of at the bottom of the heap there, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 foot deep we are. Okay, uh, the shaft uses uh, basically to get to tunnel elevation, and then once uh, we're down there and, and, the, and the tunnel is finished, they raise the water back up for uh, water distribution, and we also use them for ventilation. Uh, just looking, that's an intersection, that's uh, shaft 7B, I think, which is that high bridge coming down into, into the main tunnel. This was probably taken somewhere around 1985. Uh, this, is, uh, this is at the Siegel Street shaft, actually, and uh, this was taken on a Monday morning where our shafts were quite often swimming pools. So you can see the water there. Okay, the specific things that we do, uh, we drill and blast, we still do it. Uh, aside from the mining machine, we still do a lot of drilling and blasting. We have to support the roof. Uh, we erect tunnel steel and lino plates. We tie reinforcement bar. We build and set concrete forms. We pour concrete. We change cutters and service the TBM. And we do all our own electrical work <coughs> underground. This is some pictures of drill and blast work. And these are fairly recently. This is uh, loading a shot. This is a, a small starter tunnel uh, being done uh, right over here in Manhattan. This is actually part of the initial bell out that was done in 2002. And you can see up in the roof some of the roof support we put in just to keep the rocks above us. And then after we, we did the top, we came up and did the bottom, took the bottom out. So we ended up with an area about 700 feet long. It was uh, about 24 feet wide and 23 feet high. And this was our assembly chamber for our uh, TBM. Like I said and pointed out, we support the roof. Uh, good roof support is, uh, keeps you alive and bad roof support turns into something like that. So after we shoot, we scale. It's, uh, it's tricky business. You want experienced people doing something like that. Then we rock bolt. That uh, solidifies the rock over your head. You can see some that have been put in already. This is actually inside the TBM where we do it as close to the face as we can. Right here, these people are probably about 60 feet away from the, the heading. Another thing we do is we erect tunnel steel and liner plates. Uh, 
liner plates are done like in the, sh in the shafts in the soft ground area. And uh, this is some of the tunnel steel we erected. This was actually uh, below shaft B, I believe. Uh, this was done in the uh, early 70s. Uh, we tie reinforcement bar uh, in a water tunnel. Uh, there's not a lot of reinforcement bar put in it. Uh, this is actually one section that was a bad area in the tunnel. And it's a uh, pretty elaborate maze of rebar. All right, we build and set concrete forms. This is actually one of the arch forms that was used on the 24-foot section, which was basically from Van Cortland Park to close to Central Park in that area. This is actually a monolithic form that we use with the tunnel boring machine. Uh, it has You actually pour the whole tunnel all at once. Well, uh, we pour concrete. Uh, this is actually a finished pour at an intersection with a shaft. This is a 24 foot uh, finished, and this, this was a, a drill and blasted tunnel. This is actually the finished tunnel, and I believe this picture is outside on the wall. This is. Uh, I think this is just below High Bridge on the big turn there. We change cutters on the TBM. This is one of the big things that we do now. Uh, in Brooklyn, we did a lot of it. In Manhattan, the cutter technology is better. Uh, this is probably the worst picture I have for depicting what goes on when you change cutters. <laughs> it's, it's extremely hot when you go in the head and the head is approximately 30 inches away from the face when you go through a little porthole, and I don't see the, the hole on this one, it must be on the, on the out of the picture side. It's, uh, I have a great amount of respect for my guys that do this. And like I said previously, we do all our own electrical work, and, and with the coming of the TBM, our electrical work is, is a lot more complicated. Uh, we have a 13,800 volt feed to the machine, and off of that we're running 600 volt motors. We have conveyors or safety controls, fans. It, it really takes a crew of experienced electricians now to do our line of work. Now, besides all the different things that we do, this is actually a picture that's not of the water tunnel. And for all you Manhattan residents, if you can't guess it, this is one project that Sandhogs did. This is the Zankel Hall in the basement of Carnegie Hall. We worked here for about two years. Uh, we actually blasted in the, in the basement of Carnegie Hall. Now, in spite of everything that we do, I need an expert every now and then. And so I call on uh, Bob the Builder to help me out. <laughs> My grandson would love that. <laughs> All right, the significant changes, and some of these are up for debate, but looking back over my career, these are some of the things I think that have really changed the way we do things. Number one, without question, is the tunnel boring machine. And because of the tunnel boring machine, you have number two, which is a vertical conveyor belt. Uh, our tunnel ventilation is greatly improved. Uh, it's unbelievable the difference in the air quality in the tunnels now compared to when I first started. Uh, number four is Swellex rock bolts. They make supporting the roof so much easier. And uh, because it's easier, you do it. You don't try to cut corners. And number five is the manpower it takes to build a tunnel. First is a tunnel boring machine. In 1951, that's how tunnels were done. They were drilling blasted. That was an air jumbo. I can't really count how many guys, but this was a smaller tunnel than what we're dealing with uh, basically today. 1972, same technology, air jumbo, uh, 14 drills, I think. This is actually one of my first jobs was working here. This was at High Bridge. 
1985, it was still drill and blast, only we used hydraulic drills. This is the, the last shot on the south hole through. This is where we hold through on the south heading. 1994 was our first uh, chance to use a tunnel boring machine. This was at the uh, Nelson Street shaft. It was a 19 foot machine and it was a whole new ball game for us. We learned as we went here. 2002, this is the machine that we're using. Whoop, I did it again. That was the machine we're using now. I'd love to go in reverse, but I can't figure it out. <laughs> I, that's the machine we're using now. It's a 12 and a half foot diameter machine. And when it's all together, which it is now, it's about 750 feet long. Okay, these are some of the advantages of a TVM versus blasting. There's definitely more advanced per shift. It's safer than working with explosives. There's less disturbance of the rock, and there's a uniform size of the material, the muck coming out, so, which allows us to use the vertical belt. There are some disadvantages. It's time consuming to set one of these things up. It takes several months. Some of the systems are complex, like I said about the, the electrical needs. They're expensive. There's a long lead time to purchase or to rebuild. You don't find these things in Walmart. <laughs> this is actually a picture. All right. This is actually a picture of us picking the cutter head support and main beam of the machine we're using right now. This is about an 80 ton pick that uh, is happening. Uh, and we had a 600 foot shaft to let it down. Just shows going through the hole at the top. And that one is on the way down. And you'll see over on the right, there's a little man cage there with two of us on top. We actually went down alongside of it because there was a few things we could hit on the way down that we really didn't want to hit. It took about 30 minutes from the time we cleared till we got to the bottom with it. The vertical belt. Uh, like I said, this is one thing we have a lot of visitors come and, and they look all around, but very seldom do they look at this vertical belt. They kind of just overlook it. Uh, its advantages, it'll remove 500 tons of muck an hour. There's very few breakdowns with this thing. It just runs and runs. It has some disadvantages. The shot rock will not go through it. If you have to drill and blast, you have to crush the rock. It will not take it. It'll kick out and fall down the shaft. And these things are extremely difficult to install. If you look right here, that's a 55 ton piece of rubber that we're trying to handle. It's, uh, all of it is down, the full 600 feet is down. And what we're doing right there is we have a hold of it with this crane, which is basically holding the full weight. This crane, which you can't see, we're trying to rotate it and put it up in there. And it was, it was fun. <laughs> That's actually what it looks like when it's finished. Uh, we built the tower and everything. There's conveyors. There's actually a conveyor now that you don't see that comes out this way. That's, that's when it was new. <laughs> Looking up on top of it, that's really all it is, is a big piece of rubber with these little buckets in the center. They hold about one cubic foot, but the belt moves at 500 feet per minute. So it slings the muck up the shaft. Yeah. Down at the bottom, and I see this is when I blow it up, this picture is not great quality. This is the framework that holds it at the bottom. Uh, you can actually see it comes down, goes around, and comes up. And right in this area here where the buckets are laying flat, let me see if I go to the next picture. Another poor quality picture, but the muck comes up an incline belt and drops into it right there. It turns under a roller and goes to the top. The whole cycle, about two minutes to make a round trip. Tunnel ventilation. As I said previously, this is one of the best things that we've done in the last 30 years is make air that we can deal with. And this is mainly because of the, of the TBM. It, it allows us to do some different things. This is... Uh, this is 1985. This is basically what a fan line looked like. Just a metal conduit that 
rusted, filled full of holes with fans in it. This is 2003. We have a series of three fans. Whoops, there's two, three that you saw in the other frame. Blows through a vinyl bag into a cassette on the machine. Through that cassette, in front of that, there's this uh, scrubber fan, they call it. It has 36 filters, which actually draw air out of the head. They pass through this filter. It's discharged behind you where the other fan blows it to the shaft. That's a picture of the fan units that used with it. And that is, this is actually a soap dispenser, only it's, it's a soap we use, we spray in the head. As, as the head is turning, it uh, sprays a foam in there that actually kind of coagulates the dust and holds it down. All right, Swell X rock bolts for the next thing. Uh, some of the advantages, they're easy. They have a 10 ton pull. They're maximum holding immediately after the installation. That's the key thing with a Swell X versus an epoxy bolt. The disadvantages is they're not good in a shear. Okay, that's really all there is to them. That's a rack of probably 30. They're lightweight. Uh, you drill a hole with them, the same, and in the roof, that's what they look like. And that's on the wall, we, we hang stuff off of them. That's some of our electric cables that support the TBM. Manning is the last thing I had on our, on our list, and as a union member, it's a big thing because the TBM has changed the amount of men that it takes to do a tunnel. In 1972, with 14 drills, there was 28 men on a heading gang. And that's, uh, at that time, I think there was five or six different headings going three shifts a day. You're talking four or 500 men, just men in a heading without any support people. 1985, this was a hydraulic drill. We did the same size tunnel with seven drills. It only took, took half the men. 1994, this was the first TBM. We were down to nine men. This was a smaller tunnel, 19 foot, but nine men manned this heading gang. And now in 2005, that's actually a picture of the cutter head as we let it down in the shaft. In 2005, we have seven men on a heading crew. So really what that means is we're a lot more productive than we've ever been. But it also means with, with fewer jobs to offer, sometimes it's harder to keep a trained workforce. So that's the challenges that we face as, as tunnel workers. Lastly, I'm just gonna show you where we are today as far as the, as the Manhattan uh, tunnel goes. Looking down on Manhattan, this part of it right here has been driven. It's not concreted. We have done a short starter tunnel. That's what you saw the fellows drilling and blasting in here to get ready for the TBM. The TBM now is up in here, about 3,000 feet heading towards Central Park. Once again, thank you very much. And uh, I'm afraid we are out of time for questions. Uh, on behalf of the panel, I want to thank the Gotham Center and the Highbridge Coalition and the DP for having us. I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. And I hope you've learned a little bit more about the past, present, and future of the New York City water supply. Thank you. You know Paul? Oh yeah, I know him well. <laughs> so, Unique individual. I know him well, very well. Do too. you? Yeah. Yeah. I dealt with him a few times. Thank you, you gentlemen. Have a wonderful time. I've read both of you books. So of course, they have Take a lot of fun. I will. I don't know who's serious. Thank you so much. Be well, well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, that's I'm sorry. We got through it. Fabulous. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a big topic. Let me just. Hi, sir. My name is Mike Michelle. Uh, you're with the DMT, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm going to be leading a Wall Street bicycle tour about this fellow, Andrew Green. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Yeah. He did many, many great things for the city. And 
One of the. Okay. Got a 